The first question is how large will the earthquake be? The power of an earthquake depends on the size of the fault that breaks. In the case of the Boxing Day earthquake, it was huge. Over 600 miles of fault ruptured. The Cascadia subduction zone is almost exactly the same length, so it's likely that it will create an equally powerful earthquake. Now we do not know exactly when the next Cascadia earthquake is going to occur, but we do know that the impact of, the, of that earthquake in terms of the ground shaking, the, the huge area impacted, the extent of land level changes, the size of the tsunami which will be generated will be very comparable to that which was seen on December the 26th in 2004. Scientists believe the next Cascadia earthquake will be one of the largest on the planet up to magnitude 9. The Kobe earthquake, which killed 6,000 people and devastated the Japanese economy, was a magnitude 6.8. The terrible Mexico City earthquake, which killed over 10,000 people, was 8.1. But a magnitude 9 releases many times more energy than those. The magnitude scale is logarithmic, that is, each one is 10 times bigger than the previous number, but that's the amount of displacement. Um, when you do that in terms of energy release, each one is 30 to 40 times bigger than the previous one. So a magnitude uh, 9 is, has 1,000 times more energy release than does a magnitude 7, 30,000 more than a magnitude 6. So to put that in perspective, the, uh, the Kobe earthquake that was so damaging in Japan uh, was about a magnitude 6.8. So a Cascadia event that would reach magnitude 9 is more than a thousand times bigger than that one. Just as happened in the Indian Ocean, this huge earthquake will cause a sudden uplift of the sea floor and that will create a tsunami. The Boxing Day tsunami devastated the densely populated northwest coast of Sumatra and almost totally destroyed the town of Banda Aceh. The cities of Seattle, Portland and Vancouver will at least be spared that fate. One of the fortunate things about Cascadia in, in the comparison with northern Sumatra is that the, the big towns and, and cities aren't located right out on the, the open ocean coast. The uh, complex of waterways in Washington state means that the big ports are actually located some way inland. However, thousands of people do live on the Pacific Northwest coast. And in summer, the beaches are a major draw to tourists. A lot of the population on the Washington coast um, is vacationers. The population can grow from just a few thousand permanent population to tens of thousands of visitors. Um, and if we have a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake and tsunami, the wave crest would arrive at places like Ocean Shores and Long Beach within about a half hour. And that's a, a very short period of time to be able to move a lot of people off those peninsulas to high ground. So even though there are no major cities on the coast, there will still be many thousands of people at risk from the tsunami. But far more people will be affected by the earthquake itself. All the major cities in Washington, Oregon and British Columbia are going to experience strong ground shaking. And this megathrust earthquake will be very different from a normal quake. Magnitude 9 earthquakes have these special characteristics. One of them is that, the, that it takes several minutes for the, the fault to break from one end to the other. The, the fault rupture spreads out at a few kilometers a second, but it still may take two or three minutes to get from one end to the other. And that, that means the earthquake shaking goes on for a very long period of time. If the full 600-mile length of the Cascadia subduction zone ruptures, it will mean the earthquake will continue for as long as five minutes, just like the Indonesian earthquake did. The duration of the event is, is very unusual. 
in, and in that sense alone, it can cause more damage. Uh, a quake that goes on for longer causes more damage generally than one that, that is over within 10 or 20 seconds. So what damage will several minutes of shaking do to cities like Seattle? Even though the Boxing Day earthquake and the next Cascadia earthquake may be very similar, they could have very different effects. In Indonesia, most of the damage was caused by the tsunami, not the earthquake itself. Most people's houses are, are built out of wood. There's some more modern um, concrete, co concrete um, construction, but typically only, only one or two story buildings. So, so that these buildings are not sensitive to the very long period ground motions we can expect from a, from a magnitude nine earthquake. But the modern high rise structures of the Pacific Northwest may react very differently. Tom Heaton is an earthquake engineer from California. He was brought in to advise on the construction of a nuclear power station near the Washington coast. In the end, the project ran out of money and was never completed. But ever since, Heaton has been concerned by the question of what damage a Cascadia earthquake could do, particularly to skyscrapers. My fear is that uh, in a Cascadia event, these buildings may sway some large distance, and as we get a very long duration of shaking, that the swaying may grow in, in, in intensity, and the buildings may begin to be damaged. But not everyone agrees. John Hooper is a buildings engineer who has worked on many of Seattle's tallest buildings. He believes that the modern skyscrapers, at least, should be strong enough to avoid serious damage. Majority of the high rises here, they'll move, and they'll move a lot, but they're designed to withstand that motion and that energy absorption, and, and they go through that eight or 10 foot drift back and forth during the earthquake for several minutes, scaring a lot of people probably, but the damage should be related mainly to the non-structural components and not to the major structural elements themselves. The reality is, no one knows for sure. Because there has never been a megathrust earthquake near a modern high-rise city. These uh, very uh, large earthquakes don't happen often enough for us to understand what it is we need to do in the first place. So the building codes have never really been tested by an earthquake of this nature, at least not for tall buildings. Uh, the lessons have, haven't been learned yet. So. Uh, what concerns me is that we may learn the lesson in a very difficult way. But there is a type of building that everyone agrees will be at risk. The older brick buildings, known as unreinforced masonry, or URMs. These buildings we see around here in Pioneer Square, like many cities on the West Coast, they're constructed of unreinforced masonry, uh, bricks stacked upon bricks separated by mortar. And so if an earthquake shaking happens, those bricks end up, end up sliding past one another and they lift apart. URM buildings are very weak and very brittle. So the long duration of shaking that a megathrust earthquake will produce could cause many to collapse. URM buildings have been noticeably uh, not very resistant to earthquakes in general. Uh, and if, if you don't do some renovations and start connecting the pieces together, they're very susceptible to damage, especially in a long event like the Cascadia. Uh, and so even those that do have some uh, improvements made to them, they still might be challenged. But those that don't have any, uh, their chance of surviving is probably fairly limited. There are thousands of these unreinforced masonry buildings in the earthquake zone. They are used as homes, offices, and schools. The collapse of such buildings is likely to be a major cause of death and injury when the next Cascadia earthquake occurs. So the big question is, when will it happen?